Good afternoon, my name is Leandra Clark and I am a fourth year doctoral student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, I am just so pleased and honored to be able to interview Dr. Dent today. Dr. Dent, well, we want to start off today by asking you um, a little bit about where you're from. Um, we want to hear your life story and how it's evolved, so uh, where would you like to start? I was born <laughs> in Southampton, New York. Okay. Uh, my mother was Shinnecock Indian, so I was born in Southampton Hospital in the Shinnecock Indian Reservation, okay. uh, right outside of, well, I, Southampton grew up around the Shinnecock Indian Reservation, Wow. around the Shinnecock land, and we ended up with a reservation that's uh, surrounded by wealth in Southampton, New York. Hmm. So I was born in Southampton, lived on Long Island to, to the second grade, and, and moved to New York City in the second grade and went through uh, a, a, what I consider a very excellent educational public school system hmm. because I lived in this, this section of New York City called Greenwich Village, which is an okay. upper middle class area. I see. I uh, grew up in that area. My sisters and I were the only black or minorities in the mm -hmm. school system. Mm -hmm. and I. Uh, was fortunate enough to get a good education. I went to a school in New York City called Stuyvesant High School, which has an international reputation. They uh, just found out that having a Stuyvesant High School Alumni Association in wow. Washington, D.C. Oh, my goodness. And all the, so many big wigs are in <laughs> that group. Wow. And I was lucky enough to go, well, not lucky enough, I managed to pass all the tests to get into Stuyvesant High School. Wow. So I grew up in Stuyvesant High School, and uh, during World War II, mm -hmm. just before I graduated, I uh, decided that uh, the military, the Army, was the place for me, so at 17 I enlisted in the Army. Just before I graduated from high school, I got two GED high school diplomas, mm -hmm. but when I came out of the Army, I decided to go back to high school, back to Stuyvesant and get a diploma from Stuyvesant High School, which right. I did. In the military, <laughs> that helped me decide to go back to school. Okay. <laughs> I spent three years uh, as a medic in the uh, army, and uh, spent so much much of my time on the psychiatric section. Hmm. And that's why I decided to be go into psychology because I uh, got a lot of exposure to uh, clinical treatment, and mm -hmm. uh, I was very fortunate enough to get to have the. Uh, Psychiatrist who worked there were very supportive of me and helped me uh, learn a lot more about how to deal with patients mm -hmm. and patients who had severe mental disorders. So when I went out, I went back to Stuyvesant High School, got my diploma, and uh, went to NYU. Okay. Got a BA in psychology from NYU and went on to uh, the University of Denver got an MA in clinical psychology, and then I did an internship back in Illinois at Elgin State Hospital in Illinois, and worked for a year after that at St. Charles School for Boys, a correctional institution for mm -hmm. teenagers right. in Illinois, wow. and got so fed up being poor, mm. I decided I got married while I was there. And my wife had been a uh, lieutenant in the Army. She was a physical therapist. Mm -hmm. And she had been stationed at San, in San Francisco Presidio. So we decided to uh, come out to San Francisco. Wow. And that's what I did. That's, well, we uh, moved out to San Francisco. And then I started looking for a job. Wow. Can you talk for a minute about what it was like um, kind of during those, those formative educational years and as you moved through high school and to um, your uh, college studies? What was that like as a, a minority in the, in the, at that time? Well, as I said, I was, my sisters and I were the, about the only blacks or minorities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my father was African American, so I'm black right. in that regard but uh, uh, still uh, have my Indian heritage, mm -hmm. uh, which I can talk about later. Uh, we were the only blacks in our classes all through uh, elementary school and uh, junior high school. And it was interesting that uh, as an average kid, 
uh, I got sent to the principal's office a lot. Mm. Uh, one of the things that happened was uh, I got to be the principal's official runner to get her lunch every day oh, okay. because I was sent to her office so often. Oh, wow. Uh, nevertheless, I still got out of grammar school and went to uh, a uh, junior high school where they had what they called rapid advancement mm -hmm. classes where you do one year in one semester. And the only black teacher that I had in my entire academic career was a woman by the name of Mrs. Hicks who I had in 7A mm -hmm. and she put me in a rapid advance class and so therefore I went to junior high school in two years instead of mm -hmm. one year. And she was the only black teacher that I ever had, but she was the only one who, I guess, recognized your potential. What, what skill I had, yeah. even though I didn't recognize it, mm -hmm. uh, and sent me into this uh, rapid advance class. So in New York City, there were five high schools that you had to take exams for. And Stuyvesant High School, the high school that I went to, was one of those schools. Mm -hmm. And I was helped. To, this school was in Greenwich Village, a middle, upper middle class. And they selected students to stay after school and tutor them in uh, science and math subjects. Mm -hmm. And they were uh, noted for their academic success of the number of students who went to these for one of these made, uh, schools. Mm -hmm. And I happened to take the test and passed. Out of 22 students, one failed. Mm -hmm. uh, and I happened, went on to Stuyvesant High School. And as I said, uh, since I just found out just a few months ago that Stuyvesant High School is so well recognized that yeah. uh, they're starting an alumni right. chapter in Washington, D.C. The Assistant Attorney General, mm -hmm. uh, many people, not just black, because there were very few blacks in the school, right. were, are now. I went to a meeting and I couldn't believe Very it. important people in right. positions now. Went to Stuyvesant High wow. School. Wow. So as you went to NYU and, and continued on into your graduate education, tell us some about um, some of those those key moments, so those defining moments as a, as a black student in those programs. Well, I, I don't think I can really think of a, a defining moment at, during that period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, as I said, I got exposed to psychology in the army and was, well, I guess I originally wanted to be a physician mm -hmm. and I knew that my family couldn't afford supporting me right. through medical school. So uh, before I got left the army, it was a decision to go to become a psychologist because I found out that you didn't have to go through four years uh -huh. after uh, undergraduate because I had a GI Bill. And so, but the idea of what would I do to get through medical school, and uh, I can't say that I looked forward to a scholarship because I didn't know, even know about scholarships in those days, particularly for blacks, and so I decided to go on through uh, psychology. I can't remember any defining moments mm -hmm. in, uh, in psychology in when I was an undergraduate. I happened to be very, an active individual, okay. and I was a... Uh, Vice President of the NAACP chapter at NYU. Mm -hmm. This was in the early 50s. Uh, I was uh, chairman of a committee to get race and religion and photographs off the admissions uh, of, into Good NYU. Right. <laughs> and they, I got written up in all the local papers as a misguided, communist-led oh. black student <laughs> uh, because I was chairman of a committee who wanted to take uh, guns away from uh, campus police. A elderly campus police had shot a black man mm. and killed him at a street fair at NYU in New York City. And so we started a campaign to get rid of him or take the guns away from these police mm -hmm. who were on campus. And then I got written up in all the local newspapers as a misled, well-meaning communist-led <laughs> students, you know, so that was part of my undergraduate experience as being an activist, but I didn't see it as being an activist. Right. I saw it as responding to some uh, issues that were inappropriate as far as I was concerned. Mm -hmm. So when I left NYU, uh, when I graduated, I went on to Denver to under uh, uh, graduate school. 
uh, I went through graduate school and then went on to do my internship in Elgin, Illinois. That was a, I had some racial experiences there, mm -hmm. in the, not in the hospital itself. Well, <laughs> I had some, I was the only black, again, uh, in this uh, internship program. No, I was, there were two of us. But because I had said something on my uh, admission, my application, the FBI, I was called in and the FBI said that you said no instead of saying yes to this question. Hmm. And I'm trying to think of what it was, having to do with a driver's license or so forth. And when the superintendent of the hospital called me in, I didn't know what it was all about. And he introduced me as so-and-so, and here's Mr. So-and-so and Mr. So-and-so from the FBI. Oh, my goodness. And I couldn't believe what was happening to me. And it was all because I had said yes or no instead of yes mm -hmm. on one question on the application. But that was no big deal. Mm -hmm. But I went through this year of internship training there on Elgin. And uh, it was a, Elgin is about 40 miles west of Chicago. Okay. And it was a... Uh, I don't think the best way I can say is a redneck area, <laughs> and I couldn't get services mm -hmm. in restaurants and uh, uh, barber shops in that area. As part of the group of interns, we would hang out together yeah. and go to different places. And when we got to restaurants that refused me, the, the other guys who were we wanted to get into a fight, I said, "Come on, let's go," because I'm not into into fighting this this way through. Because I know what was going on, and it was their first experience. Mm -hmm. And that was the only kind of thing that I remember uh, during the, uh, my internship uh, in uh, uh, Elgin. So, um, so much for that. Where do we want to go from here? <laughs> right. Well, where did you go from there? How did you go? To, how did you get involved with ABCI? How did that oh, take place? Oh, after I went to uh, worked in, in in San Francisco, I became active uh, as a. Well, I, I took a job. I. I took some civil service exams and I was offered two different jobs, uh, one in vocational rehabilitation and one in uh, clinical psychology at uh, San Jose's facility, mental health uh, center. Mm -hmm. And I went to interview at another facility which had just gotten a large grant from the federal government to rehabilitate, to try to rehabilitate or train mentally retarded adults being released from state institutions. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I left, uh, I took that job instead of the other one. And that's when I really got involved in uh, development of myself as a psychologist because they needed to set up a system of assessing the skills of these individuals coming out of the state institution and to see which area of vocation we could best suit them for for job placement. Right. And the person who hired me was a psychologist, but he was the administrator, and he helped me or allowed me to develop myself and learn how to do this, even though I just had a master's degree in, in psychology. So I developed the, 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 the training, the, the assessment program without using standardized tests. Mm. Work samples, we call them and uh, designed ways of assessing the attention skills, the uh, uh, skills of te people uh, learning, accepting instructions, their physical dexterity, their hand-eye hand coordination skills to be able to help place them in jobs uh, that were suitable for them. Mm -hmm. Then we got involved in another larger physical fitness, not type, physical disability program involving non-mentally retarded people who were out of the out of work because they had been injured, injured and were trying to get back into labor, the labor situation. So I became the director of the assessment section of not only for the mentally retarded but for other physically disabled. Wow. And so that was really to my advantage. And during that time, I applied for graduate school at the University of Hawaii and got accepted, and uh, then went to the University of Hawaii for my doctorate. Mm. Uh, and uh, 
Wow. And so, so were you actively involved in AB side during this time, or is that well, something ABCide, that came this was out? before AB side. Okay. A this was in the early 60s. Okay. I went to the University of Hawaii in 63. Mm -hmm. I graduated in 66, and I took a job as the regional director of programs in what was now called developmental disabilities for the seven western states in the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, which is now HHS. Okay. And I was the director, and I had seven western states to travel to all the time. And uh, it was in 1968 when ABC, APA was here in San Francisco, mm. and that's when ABCI was started. And I was one of the people who, you know, the word got around, we're having a meeting at such and such place at five o'clock, and when we got there, there was a room full of Oh, maybe 60 people or more than that. It was so The room was so small, we had to get another room. Mm -hmm. And that's when ABCI was started. Mm -hmm. And the one thing, I, well, I remember that we had more than one session. We would, we would we met early in the afternoon, then we met that evening and started to uh, chisel out the uh, name of the organization and the priorities as we decided mm -hmm. at that time, and they decided on five specific priorities mm -hmm. having to do with psychological testing, mental health, research, uh, because we felt that the black community was being researched with no benefit as a result of that research. Uh, another area was uh, prisons mm -hmm. and training, that is, training of psychologists through APA and all the others. Mm -hmm. So those are the five priorities that we set out when we were organizing APA, I mean, ABCI at that time. And uh, it was in the first or second year of APA, uh, ABCI's development, that I was assigned to be the chairman of the testing committee. Wow. So psychological testing became my thing at that time. And that was around 1968, 69, 70, something like that. Mm -hmm. It was in 1971 when a number of us who lived in the Bay Area had gotten involved in some social action or community action activities. Okay. For example, we worked here with the Bur Oakland Civil Service Commission to change their fireman's testing program so that they could increase the number of black firefighters they were hiring. Mm. And so we helped them design a more suitable uh, civil service exam for black firefighters. Uh, we also, right here in, uh, in Oakland, uh, negotiated with Kaiser Permanente HMO to uh, accept their own uh, people who were paying into the system and delivering services to them because they had turned away a mother and her child because they thought that the child had been molested. It was a small mm -hmm. girl who had been kicked by a somebody who these kids were playing and somebody who was, I think, an outpatient uh, in uh, one of the board and care homes kicked her because these kids started laughing. They weren't laughing at him, but he thought they were laughing at him mm -hmm. and he went over and kicked uh, this little young lady. Oh, she wasn't a young lady. She was about three or four years, four or five mm -hmm. years old. I really don't know how old she was. But when her mother took her to Kaiser, they refused to see her because they thought that she was a case of molestation rather than just injury. And so we got involved with that family and we went to, to negotiate with the head of the HMO system of Kaiser. The top floor of the Kaiser Foundation building, wherever it is here in Oakland, huge, beautiful mahogany wall. One window was all glass and you could look over and see all the Bay Area. We walked in, I think, I can't remember all the names, but about four of us mm -hmm. from the crisis center in San Francisco, the mental health crisis center, and we came over. We walked in and started talking with these big wheels and the door opened and a I can't remember, I don't remember how many member, members of the Black Panthers walked in and encircled the room in their black leather jackets and their <laughs> look like uniforms and just stood with their arms folded around this table. <laughs> and Kaiser agreed to, 
to review their policy oh, and wow. change their, their position on the spot. That motivated them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but those are the kind of experiences yeah. we had once we got involved in the community. Right. So it wasn't unusual when some black parents went to the Urban League in San Francisco and said, our kids are being put in special education classes for the educably mm -hmm. mentally retarded, and we don't believe our kids are retarded. So the Urban League called us a few black psychologists. And that's how we got involved with Larry P. P. Yes. We started negotiating with San Francisco schools, mm -hmm. and we found out that IQ tests were the, the principal reason for the being placed. And that the State Department of Education was, re was required, required these IQ tests. And so we tried to negotiate with them to no avail, and uh, involved, got some lawyers involved, and they said the best thing to do is to start a lawsuit. So we then went out, several of us, one Saturday and tested some of the kids. And I think there were seven kids and six of them we found should certainly not have been placed in the mm. program. We found two of us saw the same kid and agreed without each other knowing it that this kid was appropriate mm -hmm. in his placement. So we then got this data and got the parents in, involved and the lawsuit was started. I can give you all the dates and details. But it was started in, in 71, and there were preliminary hearings and all this, and the case really went to trial in 77. It took all these years in between for hearings and so forth and so on. In 1977, it went to trial. It was eight months of trial from October to May of 78. And there was, and we have all this uh, on record, over 10,000 pages of testimony. Oh my goodness. I uh, witnessed testimony for the whole uh, trial. Uh, it ended in May and the judge, May 78, and the judge issued his decision in, I think, December of 79. Hmm. And the decision was that IQ tests were culturally biased because uh, uh, they did not account for the uh, background and experience of black children that the test had not been validated for the specific purpose for which they are being used, which was the placement of black kids in special education, EMR classes. EMR meaning educable mentally retarded, which is different from trainable mentally retarded. Hmm. Trainable was the more severely hmm. hand, uh, disabled child. Mm -hmm. uh, and educably was, there was no physical really basis for it, just poor functioning. That's called EMR. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, uh, the other thing was that the tests, as I said, were culturally biased and that they did not uh, uh, account for, uh, did not, were not validated. And he banned the use of IQ tests on black children for the purpose of placing them in special education classes. In 1979, hmm. in 19, well, they went through all sorts of uh, uh, appellate levels and the two appellate levels all reviewed the case and uh, agreed on the decision of Judge Peckham for, uh, uh, re, re, agreed on his remedies. Mm -hmm. And then a couple of years later, somebody else, a black parent in Southern California, was told that her child was not mentally retarded, he was learning disabled. And so they sued on the basis of, and they couldn't treat him, couldn't do anything for him because they couldn't use IQ tests. So we, they went back in the court. But this time, I always say, the Attorney General didn't ask those of us who had helped the Larry P case, and they lost that case mm, again. Right. And the only modification was that black parents who wanted their children tested could do it only on the basis of their agreement that they could use the test. The school district couldn't do it without the parents' demand for them to do it. So that's the only way that the case was modified, and that was the result. That happened in 1988. Wow. Since then, people, more people have tried to overturn the Larry yeah. decision, but so far they have not, and it still stands. Unfortunately, there is no enforcement of that. So school districts can slip and slide mm -hmm. in California, and all across the country it doesn't apply because it was only applicable to the state of California. But there should be more lawsuits, and this is what I'm going to ask ABCI to keep doing, right. to generate more lawsuits and to help parents recognize that they can be better advocates for their kids 
by going through the cases and taking this over. Wow. This what is else? A risk. Uh, wow, I'm just I'm blown away. It's such a, a rich history and and um, your involvement with the the case. It's just a really seminal, um, just seminal involvement. And and to look at how the climate has evolved since then. And, and so today, looking at some of the um, issues that we as Black people face, what do you think are the main issues? <laughs> I could go on forever. Yeah, or just <laughs> but the key. as as a psychologist. I'm still focused on the issue of testing. I believe ABC should take the leadership, and I've said this over and over again, in bringing about change. Because I, right now we are in the midst of a campaign where both candidates talk about change, mm -hmm. and we should get on that change bandwagon and say it's time for ABC to generate change in how tests are used with mm -hmm. black people, particularly standardized tests because it's the standardization of the test that's built in cultural bias. And we should train other psychologists in how to recognize that, and we should help parents become advocates for their kids by starting lawsuits. Because the federal government and state organizations are not gonna go into a school and say, you're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. We have to bring this to their attention. And we have the data and all the foundation for winning these cases if we just did more of it. In other words, we might have to hook up with some lawyers. And there are lots of pro bono lawyers and organizations who probably would be willing to hook up with us to do that. But we're, it's only going to happen if somebody makes the effort and stimulates this process. Because there are laws like the ones that occurred while Larry P. was in process, Public Law 94-142, which is a law that says Tests should be non-discriminatory. It should be selected and administered in a fashion that's non-discriminatory. And that uh, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, Public Law 93-112, says that every instrument used in the assessment of handicapped individuals must be validated for the specific purpose for which they're used. No standardized test is validated for placing kids in special education or any other purpose being used today mm -hmm. in employment or otherwise, and standardized tests by their very composition and construction are biased against minorities. And anybody who is not white middle class, the items just don't fit. Mm -hmm. And I can give you examples that would go on forever. <laughs> but we've got to help people understand that. We cannot generate, we cannot engage in a lawsuit unless it's generated by a parent. And we've got to educate parents to do that. Yes, we do. I agree. Thank you, Dr. Dentworth, for sharing with us um, today. I've learned a lot from you, and your work is very, very important. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is Leandra Clark. I've enjoyed, and it's been an honor to interview Dr. Dent today. Thank you. Thank you.